Hi, I'm Martin Mackay, the CEO and founder of Text Help. In this episode, we meet the CEO and co-founder of TextHelp, Martin Mackay. Founded in 1996, TextHelp has been at the forefront of literacy and numeracy software development over the last three decades, helping millions of people around the world to communicate with accuracy and fluency. With operations internationally, the company employs 350 people at its base in Antrim Town and its US office in Boston. Thanks to TextHelp's outstanding growth in recent years, Martin Mackay was awarded the overall title of EY Entrepreneur of the Year 2022. When I was 12, my dad had a stroke, and it was quite a serious stroke. Uh, he had a, a left brain stroke, which he, he lost the ability to use his right arm and right leg, but, uh, and also the ability to speak. And so at a pretty young age, I got exposed to the impact that disabilities can have on uh, the ability to understand and communicate. As soon as I was old enough, I started to make assistive technology to help uh, people with stroke, unsurprisingly, uh, but also motor neuron disease and cerebral palsy. My customers at that time were rehabilitation units and uh, university accessibility centres to support disabled students. And I was talking to a lady in Scotland uh, who told me that she had one student with cerebral palsy and about 200 students with dyslexia and uh, there, were, there were really no tools for people with dyslexia. I didn't understand it very much at that time but I, I knew it was a much bigger market, I could reach a lot more people and uh, so I, I decided to learn about dyslexia and try to make some tools and I suppose that was like almost 30 years ago and uh, so that's how I started doing what I do. It kind of taught me to kind of watch and learn and don't be afraid to pivot um, and some of the features and technology that were there for people with stroke and motor neuron disease to help them communicate, like text-to-speech and word prediction, turns out we could reuse those tools. So we were kind of reusing some of the technology that we'd already developed for a larger market. It seems very sensible now, but at the time, uh, I don't think there was a lot of logic. It just seemed like an obviously good idea. My academic path is best described as colourful. Um, I really enjoyed school I, and uh, I did pretty well at school but um, I, I don't think I was ready for university actually and I went and studied agricultural microbiology for a year, really didn't like it, uh, took a year out and did a couple more A-levels. I had a computer when I was a young kid uh, but I couldn't do computing O-level or A-level at my school and uh, I decided to get into computing. Did a couple of years uh, of computing and then uh, I thought I knew enough and uh, just really impatient to get out and do something and so I dropped out for a second time and, uh, and started the business. Um, my mother was horrified but it all worked out okay. I don't think going and doing an MBA will prepare you for running your own business. You've got to learn as you go along. Um, lots and lots of stuff will go wrong and uh, you just got to deal with it and learn from it and I have learned more you know in the last three years that I've learned in all of my life and uh, I think it's important to keep learning. You shouldn't think about going to school, going to university and stopping learning. You've got to learn all the time, all your life. I've learned more from other people in the business and other people in other businesses and from my investors and, and partners. Um, I do spend time in the classroom every year. I think it's really important to invest in yourself. Um, every year I try to learn something new. This year I did a, a cognitive performance uh, course. I spent eight weeks learning how to be a better cognitive athlete, how to be uh, more productive, uh, more focused, and just have a higher output. I really enjoyed it. And you end up learning things that you don't uh, expect to learn. And I learned a lot in that course that is actually very applicable to uh, a product that we're going to be releasing for people with ADHD, uh, because people with ADHD need help with focus, cognitive focus. I would say never stop learning and, um, and not just in the classroom, you'll learn more from other people um, than you will in the class.
we're a very purpose-driven company. I think it really helps people give some meaning to their work and have some purpose in their work. Uh, I, I think if you've got a purpose, then that's the kind of bedrock of the whole thing. If you've got some purpose and you've got uh, you know, a, a, a big ambition that's going to deliver some social good and make people's lives better, it attracts people who want to do that too. It attracts people who share the vision, who want to kind of execute that with you. It attracts investors, it attracts partners. So I think when you're doing something that's got a bit of social good about it, uh, you end up you know, surrounded by people who share the vision and will really put their shoulder to the wheel because they know what's worth doing. I definitely try not to micromanage. You know, if I was micromanaging someone, it would be me thinking that I know more than them and I know how they should do their job, and that's not the case. We hire functional experts to do a, a specific thing. You've got to give people the autonomy to do their best work, how they see fit, and then investing in people, uh, investing in professional development so that they can get some mastery. So it's pretty well established, you know, mastery, autonomy and purpose. If you get those three things together, uh, that, that makes for a, a, a happy and fulfilled team. I was saying the other day, like Alex Ferguson never scored a goal. You know, it's his team that, uh, it's his team that scores the goals. There are 370 people here and they're the people who are doing all the important stuff. Uh, I'm just cajoling them along and cheerleading them and trying to get everyone uh, going in the right direction. But it's also really important to, uh, you know, realise that you don't have all the answers and uh, there are other people around you who will have done something very similar and uh, you shouldn't be shy about reaching out. Cheerleading is uh, really important. You've got to paint that picture of where we're trying to get to and every time we're taking a step in that direction, congratulate people and thank them and be grateful for the work that they're doing because there's, you know, we can't do this ourselves. You've got to get the team together, get everyone pointed in the same direction, pulling their oars together and every time we make a successful stroke, and we move the business forward, we should all be celebrating that. I think as you get older, each time you get a little bit older and a little bit more experience, you actually get more confidence. And for me anyway, you get a little bit more confidence, you get a little bit more ambitious, you kind of build a stronger team, then you get exposed to higher caliber people, uh, real high performers with real capability. That gives you more confidence, that gives you more ambition, and you just keep, uh, keep scaling the thing. I'm a very data-driven person. Um, you know, if you want to get something to happen at Texthelp, you kind of bring the data to the meeting and the, the, the data makes the decision. And I've always found that even if I'm not in uh, control of a, a piece of the business, if, I, if, I, if I've got information that I think can help us make a better decision, I'll bring the information to the room and say, hey, I've noticed this. Do you think we should, you know, do you think we should respond to this data that, uh, that says that we should probably take a different path or, uh, or change direction slightly. If you're forging a new path, sometimes there is no data and uh, you've got to just explore it. But if you've got a feeling in your gut, you should probably respond to it. I've made 101 mistakes. I probably am an optimist. I don't, um, if something goes wrong, I don't dwell on it. I, uh, I just look at it as a learning, you know, no one learned to ride a bike without scuffing their knees and I think you just got to get up again and uh, try better next time. And uh, you know, look at every time you get something wrong, look at it as an opportunity to learn and just uh, move on. We made a product uh, that's freemium premium, so some of the functionality is free, some of it's premium. We got the freemium premium mix wrong and the free stuff was too good and uh, we ended up with a jillion users uh, using a free product and uh, yeah, that was a mistake, we shouldn't have done that. The good thing about having been around for a long time is you can remember things that you did 10 years ago and if the team are discussing something, you can say, oh, you know what, I tried that 10 years ago and this is what happened. So if we're going in that direction, let's avoid making that mistake. So I think that's a benefit of being around for a long time. I've thought of another mistake. The product that we've had most success with, we've helped about 60 million people with and we didn't know if it was gonna work at all and we didn't know how we were gonna commercialize it and we thought, Let's put it out there and make it free and see you know, if people want to use it at all. And uh, we had like 300,000 users in the first few weeks. And we thought, oh my goodness, this is going to be a good one. And uh, then we thought, well, how do we commercialize this? Let's do like a 30-day demo and start to charge for it. So we did a 30-day demo and our usage just, just flatlined. And thought, oh my god, like, what have we done? But you know, if we hadn't done the 30-day demo, and, you know, forget about that, look back at it, you've got like 300,000 users, they really want it, but we just needed to do, take it to market differently. 
we ended up doing a freemium premium product and we got the product mix right and you know, three years later we had four million users. I think in 2016 we became Google's technical partner of the year. But if I've been put off by the failure of the 30 day demo, um, we would just, it would have been, uh, that would have been a real mistake uh, because it's like our biggest product is probably 70% of our revenue. I would say the biggest mistake is to do nothing and sort of, you know, uh, kind of stare at the mountain and think, oh my God, I'll never get to the top of that. I, I would just like walk up the next hill and uh, keep on going. For me, one approach that I have always taken is to not put myself first. In fact, really think about, kind of forget about yourself. If you put your customers first and your employees first and your team first, and your investors first and try to do things for them. Um, I've always found that just the more you do for other people, the, the more it comes back. We approached Google in uh, 2014 when they entered the education market in the US with Chromebooks and they had started an education partner program and I thought, well, that's, that would be really, that would be very good. I went to California and met with the lady who was running the partner program and I just said to her, look, we wanna be your best partner. Can you tell me exactly what I need to do to be your best partner. What does your perfect partner do for you over the next two years? And she told me, and I wrote it down, and then I came back here and said, this is what we need to do, guys. Let's get on with this. And we, we just did it. Um, so I would not, don't be shy about asking them for exactly what they want. Very often when you see a partner program, you look at the benefits for you, but uh, you really, the purpose of the partnership program is for it to be good for both people. And if you don't really understand what they need and want from a perfect partner, then it's going to be hard for you to blunder your way through and deliver that for them. In the same way, if you want to form a good partner relationship, if you want to have a good customer relationship, you need to talk to them and ask them exactly what they want. You know, what, what does this product need to do better? Or what other problems are you facing in the classroom or in the workplace that we can help you with? Really just ask them exactly what they want, have a really candid conversation with them, and, and then do your best to deliver that for them. There's generally a consolidation phase in most, most markets, and we thought that our market was ready for uh, that consolidation phase. There were companies that we've acquired in Norway and Sweden and the US and, and Denmark that were all doing a really similar thing, um, but in, just in different markets. And some of us were doing a better job in some areas than others. And 2020, I think, I kind of wrote a detailed vision document that, said, that kind of painted a picture of where exactly we would be in uh, four years time, three years time. It included, you know, how many staff we would have, what markets we would operate in, what our types of customers we had, what our customers said about us, what people were reading about us in the press, what our culture was like. And I laid that out in detail. And in that, it, it kind of, you know, it was painting a picture of a kind of unified market uh, where instead of fighting with each other, we were all trying to achieve the same goals. And uh, that vision deck was incredibly useful during the, the m and because people could see it's not, this is not a cynical, uh, you know, bottom line driven thing. We're small companies trying to affect social change. And if we don't get all on board together with the same mission and vision and marketing plan, uh, we're not gonna have as much success or get as much traction. When you end up talking to the founders, they're all trying to do the same thing. We're all trying to do the same thing together. And, uh, you know, for us, the acquisitions have been brilliant, uh, really effective, really good to meet the founders and a uh, great bunch of people. Um, actually, Don Johnson, who was one of our, the company that we bought in the US, uh, believes in the vision so much that he's a, a shareholder and on our board. For 10 years, we competed against them and to, to be together, working together to have Don as a shareholder and a, and a, a board colleague is fantastic. It's, re it's a really good thing. Um, and it's been transformative for us. It, we've doubled our headcount, doubled our turnover, we've much more global reach, but we've really formed, a, I think, a, a large team of people who are really on the same page and trying to get the same thing done. I have a really good relationship uh, with uh, our investors, Five Arrows, and they've been incredibly helpful. Um, you know, uh, like, like the vision thing is useful again. You know, whenever we kind of told the story of what we we're trying to achieve, they immediately rallied around and said, okay, let's plan this. What do you need? Do you, you know, do you need better, do you need more people? Uh, do you need to invest in product? What is it that you need to do? And I think as long as you're in alignment, as long as everyone is clear on 
what the goals are, what's the term of the investment, um, what are we going to try to achieve during, during this term of investment. Um, as long as we're all on the same page and aligned, um, I think investor relations is uh, easy, good fun. Team transition over the years is a really important and kind of difficult area. Uh, I'm not, you know, something they just have to deal with. The the team that we had that grew us from, you know, 90 people to 150 people. Um, some of the people in in there weren't the people to take us to, you know, 400 people and to get into international markets. The things that we're doing needed a, a different set of skills. So we had to get a CFO in who had good. PE and M&A and EdTech experience. Um, as we're scaling, I've, I've never worked in a big company, um, did not spend 10 years in IBM. So we had to bring in people who have worked in big companies. Um, and so we brought in a, like a COO and build out an ops team. Um, and uh, my COO used to be in Microsoft senior team in the UK. So really good, you know, big company experience. It's kind of like the football analogy. Some people come through the academy, some people have to come from another team. And it's just finding that blend, giving people a really good career path, investing in the, the top performers that are in the business and really giving them headroom and, and space to grow and a, a kind of something challenging to achieve, but also the capabilities in the business and what capabilities we'll need in two years. Because if you need the capabilities in two years, you should be recruiting them now so that they're well embedded in the business, understand it fully and are operating at full tilt you know, when, uh, when they're needed to be there. Having a, a kind of international business with, you know, um, offices and staff and customers in very distinct cultures is, um, you know, it's interesting. Um, not only do you have to localise the product and make sure that in the US it speaks with a US accent, in Canada it's got, you know, Canadian accents and so on. There's a lot of cultural th stuff that's just different. I've certainly made cultural faux pas in every market that I've been to and uh, again you kind of do those things and, uh, and learn from them. But there's just a very different work culture in each market and I think the important thing is to do your best to learn about that and you know be open-minded and I think you know there are things that we've picked up from the acquired companies that have kind of got embedded in our culture that are, uh, that are really good and hopefully things that we do here that we've kind of transmitted to the Nordics and, uh, and that they're enjoying as well. You just got to be uh, open to difference and uh, try to be like inclusive of the cultures around the place. And if you can have an impact and do what you want to do in one, in one territory, um, there's nothing wrong with that at all. Ireland's not a huge place. If you want to build a really big business, you have to export. I think if I had been born in the US or Canada, I might not have ever thought to export. Um, because there's a, that market's absolutely huge, but I think it's probably in, in Irish entrepreneurs' DNA to you know look internationally because the market's of you know, relatively limited size here. We try to make our product really affordable, so it's only like two dollars per student for uh, in school, and uh, so for us to grow a really big business, we really need to you know to get into bigger markets. Eighty percent of the uh, schools in the U.S. don't have tools for their dyslexic kids, probably closer to 99% of uh, employers around the world don't have tools for their dyslexic employees. They could really benefit from the help. So we're not going to stop. We can always grow. We can always get better. We can always have new ideas and reach more people and be more helpful. I think there could be a danger of trying to scale too quickly, but not too much. I think if we tried to scale you know, this year into South America and Africa and Asia all at once, we would drop the ball and uh, we would be spreading ourselves too thin. So what we've, you know, done in the last uh, three years, I suppose, is really focus on North America, Nordics and UK and Ireland and really focus on getting a well-established, professionalised, consistently tightly run business in those territories. And once that's mechanised and operationalised and nice and efficient, then we'll be looking at you know, other territories. We need to do stuff in South America, we need to do stuff in Asia, we need to do stuff in Africa. In some of those territories, the educational technology market's a little bit less mature, and uh, so the market's not ready. When those markets wake up, we want to be there with the coffee. The 2022 EY Entrepreneur of the Year is Martin Mackay.
Martin, congratulations. How are you feeling? I'm completely blown away. I uh, was not expecting this. It's fantastic. Winning the Entrepreneur of the Year thing was actually a complete surprise for me and to be seen that way by the judges who are all incredibly successful, uh, much, much more successful than me, is really, really gratifying. But I think the important thing for me is the programme itself. To get to spend like a week on the road in Austin and in New York with two dozen other business leaders. When you're at the top of the organisation, you don't have a peer group to speak to and to be able to go and spend a week and uh, pick their brains and share experiences, form lasting friendships. And also during that time, as well as getting exposed to other business leaders, there's a really good professional development program and it's also really good fun. So the whole program from start to finish has just been unbelievable and the ongoing aspect of the alumni program is just next level. Getting exposed to that network is brilliant. World Entrepreneur of the Year, the experience in Monaco was world class, uh, just absolutely incredible. Not just the spectacle and the surroundings, but to get to meet 50 other uh, you know, winners from around the world and to get to spend actually really quite meaningful time. Uh, I learned a lot. I took six pages of notes from uh, us sharing leadership experiences and I've already put a few of them into practice. And uh, it, you know, it was just such an incredible, incredible event. Hopefully I've made a few friends for life is there something that everyone has in common? Probably all a little bit quirky, everyone's a little bit different. I think very, very driven, and uh, I actually think really nice people. Uh, you know, genuinely lovely people with a lot of drive. Just, uh, do you know what? I would love to spend more time with them. Brilliant people. I really don't see myself as remotely special, and I don't think I've done anything particularly remarkable yet. I think when you're in the business, I, well, for me anyway, I just see stuff that I want to make go faster or do better. And uh, when I look around the alumni, I keep thinking, Jesus, look at these guys, look at, look what they're doing. Uh, so we're probably, all, we're probably all looking at each other, uh, thinking the same thing. Everyone has a slightly different path through life and everyone has a slightly different experience. So it's a really good opportunity to, uh, to learn about their, their journeys. Um, you know, some have gone through venture and PE, some have done it all themselves. And if someone is deciding to do like a PE round for the first time, it's really, really good to be able to reach out to your network and uh, discuss that with them and see, you know, if they have any recommendations. I think being a member of the alumni absolutely increases my ambition. And here's why, it's increased my capability. I know my network's bigger and better and stronger. And I have a, a group of a few hundred people who I can reach out to to help me solve problems. And uh, that just is another boost, it's just another weapon in the armor, you know, it's, a, it's such, a, such a powerful, positive thing. There are 600 people who have all grown businesses and they've got their own areas of expertise, be it property or insurance or intellectual property licensing. Uh, they'll connect you with uh, recruitment specialists. Uh, they've been so valuable and I've been lucky enough to be able to give back to that community a little bit and, uh, and you know, tell people about some of the mistakes that I've made that they could potentially avoid and also make some introductions. I think that's incredibly important. Don't think that you've got the answers and uh, reach out for help and grow your network. And uh, also just bring talent into the organization because it's talent and people that will move the business forward. Um, you can't do it all yourself, particularly if you're trying to scale the thing and, and reach more people. You just need to get talent. In.